Good morning. Thanks for getting up. Um, today I've got uh, probably too much to talk about. I'm going to present a two-part talk. Um, the first part has to do with a paper we published last spring in GRL, and I'll be going through that relatively quickly, and I'll encourage you to have a read at it. It talks about the decadal mode and sea surface temperatures in the South Pacific and ocean heat content. And the second part is something I'm working on right now, and I think I've, I have some questions I'm going to show you, and I'm actually interested in some feed, feedback on the second part. I'm looking for some help. So this is a figure you may have seen from, I uh, borrowed from Trenberth and Fasulo, a paper where they, um, they simply took the surface air temperature difference between the, the hiatus period and the period of the period before that. And this is the change in um, surface temperatures, and particularly in the Pacific, this pattern is almost identical to the PDO, and it sort of highlights the importance of the PDO maybe in this process of heat sequestration in the ocean. Um, I'm going to be talking today about our coral records from Fiji, Tonga, and Rarotonga. This is the first part of this talk. We've got three different long strontium calcium records of temperature. I'll be talking about the decadal mode in that, and I'll be comparing them to some records on the Pacific and also to this site in New Caledonia over here. Um, this has already been talked about by Clara Dester, but one of the rationales for doing this kind of paleo work with corals is that there's a lack of um, SSC observations, particularly in the South Pacific. This shows the number of ICOADS measurements in the boxes for Fiji, Tonga, and Rarotonga. Um, and before about 1960, there's big gaps. There's actually no data during the World War I and World War II. And the same also applies to the North Pacific, I'll point out. There's more data in the North Pacific, but there's still some issues with um, how much data there actually is to even reconstruct the PDO index. So I've got a couple of figures here about what corals are and how we use them. This is a very large coral from American Samoa. We cored, um, um, for those who hadn't seen this, this is a, was a fish for scale over here. Um, these corals are... Uh, only alive on the outer edge, about an upper centimeter of very hard uh, skeleton and tissue. We call the tissue layer below that. Inside, there's simply dead skeleton. It's bone white. Um, we take, take cores out of the middle. We're very careful to plug the holes when we're done, and they heal over. Um, sometimes we can core corals that are very shallow. This one was uh, in Tonga. It's actually one of the cores we used in this reconstruction. This coral had died in the 1982-83 El Nino event when sea level dropped about 30 centimeters in Tonga. But we had live tissue on the sides, and usually we avoid these things, but actually this worked out really well. We were able to take a core out of the side here, and we splice it into the top of the, of the dead part, and this is the top of that, and it runs down into the 17, 1790s. You can see the, um, uh, these are density bands, and actually these are annual density bands. They grow about a centimeter, a centimeter and a half a year. We, um, these white little lines are our sample paths, <clears throat> where we drill out every millimeter typically um, of coral powder to do geochemical analyses. We do not use the banding in our lab to generate the chronologies. I'll talk about that in a minute, because sometimes there's subannual banding, so we rely on reconstructing the annual cycle in water temperature to generate our chronologies. So this is the paper that came out in GRL in April. I encourage you to have a, a look at it. Um, there's a link on my website, some more information about it. I'll be going through this the first half of the talk right now. So the main tracer I'll be talking about today is strontium-calcium, um, the strontium-calcium ratio in cor oh, coral aragonite. For thermodynamic reasons, um, str str strontium substitutes for calcium into the aragonite lattice. And the, the chemistry is such that um, when the temperature goes up, the amount of strontium goes down. At least that's the prediction. And in many corals, we find nice calibrations like this one I'm showing you at Rarotonga, where that relationship seems to hold up really well, where we have a pretty tight relationship between the strontium-calcium ratio and the sea surface temperature. So the red line here is temperature um, from the IGOS data set, and the, the do black dots are our strontium-calcium measurements. In millimoles per mole, you can see the ratio is decreasing upward. The green data is actually a thermometer we stuck in the water next to this coral at 18 meters. We wanted to verify that the, at 18 meters depth that the, actually we were getting the same amplitude um, of the temperature cycle, and we were. And then we, um, the other thing we're doing is we tune the chronology, just so you know, we, we tie these points, typically to uh, that point and the two points per year to the annual cycle, so that, that's a, um, how we generate our chronologies. But you can even see, regardless of that, if we did an annual average through this, uh, both of these, we'd have a high correlation between 
Strontium calcium and temperature, and we use that to, cal to generate a sensitivity, an equation that we can then reconstruct temperatures with. So we did this at all three of these sites I'll be showing you, at Fiji, Tonga, and Rarotonga. I'm not going to show you all the calibrations. They're all very similar. All on, um, this is millimeter scale data in all records, and this is all the data here in this composite up here. So each one of these cores, Tonga, Fiji, and Rarotonga, goes back um, into the 1790s. <clears throat> There's probably over 6,000 measurements um, in this, and you can, what I've done simply in this uh, composite, in this paper, is I did annual averages of, of each, uh, each um, coral, you calendar your averages, and then I, which is the individual data here, and the black line is the average of those th three annual averages, and around that is our standard deviation. This um, highlights this very um, weak, but I think significant decadal mode that's in the temperature in this region of the South Pacific, in this region that is highly correlated with the PDO and the IPO. And that's what I'll be showing you uh, in the next couple of figures. So one of the problems we have is highlighted here. This is a, this is, so this is our, F, I call it the FTR composite Fiji Tonga Rarotonga. This is our coral data and with the standard deviation around. These are the two different, two different data products, two different temperature products we're trying to compare it to. The ICOAD, so this is the, the ICOAD data for Fiji Tonga and Rarotonga for those three different sites, three different boxes, and the ERSST process the same. You can see the temperature data sets are even, have some discrepancies, although the, um, we do get better correlations between our composite and the temperature records than we do with the, you know, the individual records, which I think highlights the fact that we're increasing the signal-to-noise ratio when we make these a composite in this way, if we're, as long as we do it carefully. So I would argue that this um, record here, which is going back now to 1791, is a fair representation of sea surface temperature or decadal modes, changes in temperature in, the South, in this region of the South Pacific. So on the top here, I've got that F, what I call the FTR composite in, in black back to 1791. Uh, the blue data is when you include the Strontium calcium record from Christine DeLong in New Caledonia, which is much farther to the west and not quite in the same region. The correlation to the um, PDO or IPO goes down a little bit when you add in the New Caledonia record. So I haven't included the New Caledonia record in the composite, but it's a, the, I put it here to show you that the decadal mode is um, pretty widespread across the southwest Pacific. Um, this is the ERSST data. Uh, with, I've, I haven't shown the data in World War I or II because there's no ICO as data at all during those intervals. And I think the data that's been infilled is, um, uh, I actually think it's not correct in these, in these boxes. Um, down here is our FGR recon reconstruction, just um, showing you its comparison to the PDO and the IPO indices and this decadal variability. So the, this is the annual average of the dots and there's a five year running mean I just did through the, through the data. So that's a very, um, simple processing. And I think this highlights this, the decadal mode is, at least in the late 20th century, appears to be, um, have a relationship to what's going on in the North Pacific. Um, the uh, evolutionary specter of the, our time series shows that the, the recurrence interval is around 20 years in the late 20th century, and it gets a little more complicated in the, before that, but it's somewhere between 20 and 25 years. Um, and so I think this represents the decadal mode in the South Pacific, and we might be able to use this as some, um, this is a pretty long, it goes back to you know, 1790, it's the longest reconstruction of the decadal mode so far in the South Pacific. Um, he, this is another observation from this work. This is, I compared our FGR reconstruction here to upper ocean heat content in the South Pacific from the Levitas et al. data set. And so this is the entire South Pacific heat content in red dots. I, um, I've got the five-year running mean as a dashed line, and I've got the individual yearly measurements uh, in here. And a, the correlation is not, um, um, it's 0.45, um, if, 0.82 if you do a five-year running mean. And I think this is interesting because it suggests that when it's um, warmer at the surface in the South Pacific on the decadal timescales, it's actually the whole upper ocean is warm. We're gaining heat in the upper ocean. And this seems to fit with this um, meridional overturning cell mechanism. We're storing heat in the ocean during some decades and releasing it during others. If you compare this, um, which I did in the paper, to uh, the, the global temperature curve up just here in green, and the dotted line is the, so the decadal extraction of that, I, I think there is some relationship between um, some, in, some decades where it's cooler in the South Pacific and it's warmer in the um, global atmosphere. 
it's not um, a perfect agreement in many places, but I think there's some um, evidence, as other people have pointed out, between this, uh, the heat sequestration in the, in the Pacific Ocean and global temperatures. So that we then took our records and we're going to compare them to now some um, decadal, some uh, uh, coral-based uh, data from um, the equator, from the Nino 3-4 area. I'll be looking, showing you from records from Jarvis and Palmyra, um, Miana. So on the top panel is the actual isotope measurements from three different corals. I, I made sort of a, what I call a Nino 3-4 coral composite, um, which is the, uh, the black line is the average. And this blue line is a nine-year smooth of that. And this, these corals are remarkably well correlated. And they, they actually have a very weak decadal signal. Oxygen isotope values in corals are a function of temperature and salinity. Um, and at this site, there's, there's a mixture of both variables affecting them. And the, the only decadal shift in the, in the equator that cor corresponds to the South Pacific is the 1976 shift. Um, coherency analysis indicates there's no, there's the, the other decadal modes and the oxygen isotopes are not coherent. But the bottom panel, is now the strontium calcium records from a couple of these corals, one from Jarvis, which was released, published by Thompson in 2014, and Palmyra, and our record at FTR is the black line. So what I had to do, because the, the Jarvis data was only released in a detrended, nine-year smooth format, I don't have the raw data. So I actually processed all the other records the same way. So our record has now been detrended here in the black line in a, a nine-year smoothing, and notice I inverted it. So when it's warmer in the South Pacific, it's warmer on the, um, equator. So well, it's warm in the it's cold around the equator. It's, it's opposite. And notice the blue data is the highest correlation um, at Jarvis. Jarvis is uh, a little bit south of the equator. Palmyra is a little bit north. And I think this suggests that um, uh, it supports the England all idea of the trade wind fluctuations forcing decadal changes in uh, surface temperatures on the equator and driving these meridional uh, overturning circulation into this both the North and South Pacific, tricking the South Pacific and we're um, sequestering heat. So I think our, our data seems to suggest that this model is, uh, has, uh, supports this model in terms of uh, tr helping to um, uh, modulate the, um, the, you know, the heat content of the upper ocean in the Pacific. So that's part one of uh, the talk. This is the part two. This is the part I'll be looking for some comments on if, if anyone has any. Um, we've been working on a large coral from American Samoa, and I'll be showing you some data from the upper part. Now, Samoa is just a little bit farther to the north. Here's American Samoa, Tau. These are the sites in Fiji, Tonga, and Rarotonga, just south. This is a, the sea surface temperature. Here's the warm pool. This is the sea surface salinity. You can see the South Pacific convergence zone. And this dotted line is the sort of a salinity front running uh, through the area that sort of demarcates fresh water from salty water. So Samoa is not very far away, but it's quite uh, climatically quite different. And that is because um, these are the nodal lines for where the Nino, uh, and so in the PDO or IPO correlation fields run through the air. I mean, I mean nodal line means zero correlation line. So here's the example. Here's the uh, PDO pattern, as we know, and this is our site in Samoa, and you see that this, this zero correlation line runs right through Samoa for the PDO, and the same is true for ENSO. And so you would predict that um, this would not be a good place to reconstruct ENSO or the PDO. Um, and you might wonder why we even collected the coral there at all, but it was a very long coral, and I think there's some interesting information we can get out of this. It also highlights, I think, that the corals are recording what's going on. So, so, I'll, so I'll be focusing on the, the El Nino or interannual mode for the, for, the, for the rest of the talk. So this is a paper that came out last spring by Shen and others in Nature Geoscience about doing cluster analysis on the different... Um, flavors of, of ENSO. And they came out with three different clusters. Mark Keynes you know, told me more recently that he now thinks it's like more of a continuum. But, um, but they had three different clusters in this paper. Um, that this, this is 18% of their El Nino events were these very strong El Ninos, Eastern Pacific types. 35% um, were the Whirlpool El Ninos, and 47% were the canonical type. And the dot is the American Samoa. The, um, there's no differences between the La Ninas. But what's interesting to me was the fact that the large El Nino events cause cooling um, in the American Samoa area, whereas the other two types don't. And just farther south in Fiji and Tonga, it gets cooler and saltier during every El Nino event. And so what we're seeing, even though it's on the zero correlation line, there's actually there's lots of variability over time you'd predict. And this is another uh, result that applies. So this is a paper by Kai and others about the SPCZ position. It was published in Nature in 2012. 
they looked at rainfall data, and they um, were looking at these, these South Pacific inversion zones, they call them zonal events, when the SPCZ collapses onto the equator. So during normal El Nino events, the, uh, which is the green shift, the, the SPCZ shifts to the north and east, and it, it gets uh, cooler and saltier in the Fiji Tonga area, and sometimes at Saboa, which is down here. In La Nina, it shifts the other way. But during these large El Nino events, like 97, 98, 82, 83, the SPCZ collapses onto the equator in what they call these zonal events. And these are the events I think we can see pretty clearly in Samoa. And what's going on? Um, uh, here's the here's Samoa region, here's the South Equatorial Current. Um, the South, this is very, it's a, it's a very salty water over here in the northern gyre center, which gets, gets evicted over here into the South Pacific region of Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa. And what happens during El Nino events is the southern part of this area gets very salty and cool, and it sometimes happens at Samoa. And the opposite happens during La Nina events. The SPCZ expands. So our coral data is uh, shown here in the bottom panel. So the calibration, this is the um, temperature and salinity at the site. The blue is a uh, temperature, salinity is in red. And you can see there's a quite a complicated um, pattern between these two parameters. Our coral data is in black. Now, if you make the assumption that the coral data is driven only by temperature and salinity, you can actually calculate a modeled coral delicate, which I call pseudo-coral here. And the pseudo-coral is in green. And the, so the model actually, the, the data fits the model pretty well. The correlations are about 0.6, um, given some of the chronology uncertainties we have on the annual basis. That's pretty good. And I think this tells us the coral is actually recording, the deloitine of the coral is recording this complicated um, mixture of uh, temperature and salinity variability at this site. And it receives, you can see the big El Nino events, 97, 98, 82, 83, gets cooler and saltier. So on the top here, I've removed, I've extracted the, the interannual band in Delo 18, and I've detrended the data and compared it to the Nino 3-4 index. And the, the arrows highlight the, um, the very large El Nino events where it gets uh, cooler and saltier at Samoa. And you see they're concentrated in the late 20th century. And if you do a running correlation through the, uh, this with a 25-month um, window, this um, interesting pattern comes out. And you see, so, the, so on the zero correlation line, you expect that it would, it would be shifting around over time. Um, but it appears to be um, shift from one mode to another in the mid-1920s. And right around 1927, actually, is quite an abrupt shift. Where the, so in this part of the record, we, it's saltier on average and cooler in uh, Samoa during El Nino events. And before that, it's warmer and fresher. In the 1920s, and it may should be shifting back again late, early, farther back in the record. And this, if we um, compare our coral record now, which is in red, which with the trend in it to the the coral composite record I showed you before, we get the same exact pattern. The in 1920s, the mid 1920s, something happened with the um, the, the correlation or the phasing of, of El Nino events or the, um, to the to the tropics um, in the South Pacific. And so what I think is going on is it's getting warmer and fresher um, at Samoa before 1920s in Samoa during El Nino events, and the opposite is going on after that. And this may qualify as a climatic shift, I'm wondering, based on a talk on Monday. This is not true at Fiji, just to the south. This is a record from Emily Dossier's composite paper in 2014. There's no uh, phase shift in the 1920s to the uh, Nino 3-4 temperatures. So this is only going on at Samoa, which is to the north. This corresponds to, a, as we've talked about, a sort of switch in the AMO in the Atlantic in, in the mid-1920s. And it also corresponds to, um, or I'm not sure this is related, but there's an interesting, um, the largest floods in the Mississippi River ever were in 1927. It went over you know, 27,000 square miles of the floodplain was up in 30 feet of water, and it was the biggest flood ever. And I'm not sure this is related, but I wonder what's going on in the mid-1920s. And what I think, um, what I think I was going on is that people think the ITCZ has shifted north in the 1920s in the Atlantic, and I think the SPCZ did the same thing. I think it was farther to the south and west um, before 1927, and it shifted to the north rather abruptly. And that would explain, um, I think, the, the pattern we see of El Nino variability at, the, at this site. So to wrap up here, um, uh, I think the decadal mode in the South Pacific, at least back to, for over the 200 years, is around 20 to 25 years in temperatures. And I think this supports our, the, what I've showed you supports this shallow returning cell mechanism for storing heat in the ocean. 
I think uh, our Samoa data suggests that there's a, some kind of abrupt change going on in the 1920s. And I'm going to look more and just get some feedback from people here. And I wonder if there's a coordinated ITCZ change in both basins at this time. And I want to point out that I, I'm, um, I, th I think that some of this work highlights the need to really closely look at these paleo sites um, related to small scale variations in the ocean, particularly at places where there's gradients. Um, because I think the small scale, small scale variations in the oceans do matter, and we need to keep, keep, uh, keep track of them, and we do our interpretations. So I'll stop there. Thank you.